is on um, the calling. We've asked just a number of people just to share uh, some aspect of their life and how they're living out uh, their calling. Today's theme is particularly identity. And the person who is uh, sharing is named Frank Tellus. Many of you know him as Frank the Tank. Uh, and you'll see behind me a weightlifting set which kind of represents uh, him. And if you saw him, you would, you would know why. Uh, Frank, I came to know as a college student. Uh, he was uh, on a football team. It's a big part of his identity. And, um, but he became a Christian through the college group and uh, actually went through our protege program. And it's actually this morning... Uh, Frank has actually just recently taken a job. He'd been working for a teen center in West Sacramento during his protege year, and, and this local church, the Covenant Church in West Sacramento that helps run that, has hired him as uh, their youth pastor. So he's actually serving at a teen center for at-risk youth in West Sacramento, and now he's just taken on this role um, in uh, Sacramento. Uh, we often just have him still at our evening service. But he wanted to share his uh, story with all of us, particularly about his uh, identity. And since he's right now, as we speak, uh, working with uh, young people in West Sac, uh, we have it via video. And so we have, uh, we have Frank's story. My name is Frank Tellis. Uh, I was a regular attender of UCC for the last four or five years. Um, but now I'm actually working at another church in West Sacramento, Lighthouse Covenant Church, as well as working at the Calling Teen Center in West Sacramento. And so my story starts off with uh, just me always finding my identity in football. I first started playing the sport when I was in fifth grade. And from then on, I just loved the sport. And the thing that I loved about it is that I could hit people and I wasn't going to get in trouble for it. I was actually praised for it. And that was awesome. And so that just started a a great love in my life and so from that point on I just played football all the time. Uh, once I got into high school is definitely when I started realizing that this is the time when I could get noticed uh, by schools and possibly be able to play uh, football. Uh, didn't get noticed during high school but decided that I was going to play football at a commu community college. So I tried out at Sacramento City College and was just going through the grueling workouts day in day out during the summer. I uh, thought I was doing really well but at the end of the tryouts, uh, my name was not on that list. And it was just such a bummer, such a devastation. I, I felt like I had lost a big part of my life. Um, and just faced this identity crisis of who am I? What am I? I'm no longer Frank, the football player. Um, I'm just kind of Frank. And so uh, at the time, I started actually going to Catalyst, the college ministry here. And I remember just one of the first times that I went, I I asked Matt for prayer and just kind of laid my life out to him and told him about just how I feel like so many people are saying no, no, no uh, to me in my life. And he responded by saying, well, Frank, who's saying yes to you? And I said, well, my family, uh, my mom, because I think she loves me at least, uh, and, and you guys, Catalyst. And after I, me saying that, he responds with, and so is Jesus, Frank. So I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Jesus is saying yeah to me. Duh, Frank. That's like the most obvious answer ever. And so that really just started kind of me me asking, who am I? What do I mean? Uh, what does it mean to me to follow Christ? And what does that look like? Um, and so throughout that time, I was also just still going through that dark season and started drinking and partying um, and just, just still kind of healing from a lot of things. And so... I went back to Catalyst after the season of rebellion and sorrow and uh, went to base camp and it was a great time and it was just such a meaningful experience where I was able to interact with lots of people. And after that, uh, October uh, 9, 2011 is when I, got, when I got baptized and so three years ago and I just remember that first that first moment and saying yes to Jesus like all right well I'm in it for the long haul Jesus where are you leading me? And so since then, trying to understand that uh, question of where are you leading me? And since then, gaining a lot of peace and, and comfort as to where God is leading me. Um, and just knowing that ultimately, He wants me to seek Him out first and everything else will follow. And so now I am working at, at a church. I'm working at a teen center. And I definitely know that my identity is found in Christ. I used to identify myself as so many other things and not very positive things at all. Uh, but above all else, now that I am in Christ, I, 
I'm a beloved child of God, and that's where my identity stands. It's great to hear that, isn't it? Um, now I want to introduce you to another friend of mine. This is called The Pulpit. Uh, you haven't seen this in a long time, but get used to it. It's back. <laughs> and these are called notes. Um, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm just uh, delighted to have the privilege to, uh, to share with you on this topic of identity. Identity, this, this question. As we're thinking about who we are, who we are called to be, we're thinking today about identity. Who are you? How do you understand yourself? What do other people call you? If you're introduced uh, by one person to another, they say this is blank and they give a name and then they perhaps give you some labels or some associations. What are those labels and associations that you carry? Who, who are you? Here, uh, you will know me as a pastor, and that has certain meanings and certain understandings and associations for you, that, that label pastor. And some of that is relational. Some of that is, you know, a professional. There's just certain things that come to you. Okay, that is a pastor. And for some of you, that's a good thing. And maybe for some of you, that might not be such a good thing, depending on whatever your life experiences have been. The same thing would be true for any sort of professional mark or think with me for a minute about what comes to your mind, the, the thoughts and feelings and expectations that come to your mind when I say the word dentist. Maybe my wife just jumped. She's got sensitive teeth. What if I say the word professor, teacher, janitor, stay-at-home parent, meter maid? What comes to your mind I say farmer or day laborer. Certain things come to our minds with those labels, with those associations, feelings, expectations, depending on our past experience, depending on our culture. And these professional labels uh, are identity markers that are really important in our society. Our society regards those as such a big way to define you. It's often one of the first things people ask you when they meet you. What do you do? In addition to these professional markers, there's other things in which we meet people that, that form our sense of their identity. Even now, as you're looking at me, you might notice a few things, like I am male, for example. I hope you've noticed this. Uh, I am in my mid-30s. I am white. I am tall. I speak English with a Californian accent and somewhat educated diction. <laughs> Somewhat. And you, uh, you, you notice these things about people without even asking. You just encounter them and you absorb them and they, they form in your mind, they craft in your mind some understanding of the identity of the person that you're talking to and you sort of associate them even subconsciously. Also, if you know me and you've come to know me in certain ways that you will, um, your, your sense of my identity will be shaped by things like my skills and passions and personality traits. So you may, if you've played sports with me, you might identify me as, as, as someone who gets a little too competitive. Or if you um, have played strategy board games with me, you've identified me as someone who gets very, very competitive. Um, you might identify me as someone who plays practical jokes that sometimes go awry. Like a few days ago when on Facebook I pretended to have World Series tickets to give away. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't go so well as childhood friends came out of the woodwork to uh, cozy up, you know, so sometimes those don't go. Well, you might identify me as like a rabid 49er fan because I've spoken about that before. You, you associate people with skills and passions and interests and they form your sense of that person's identity. When I am at home, all of these identity markers, they just fade away and I am known by my son and my daughters as, as daddy. And nothing else matters. I am, I am daddy, and what comes to their minds is, is laughing and tickling and, and wrestling and joking together. That's my label in that venue. These are associations. These are identity markers that the world kind of around me would look at me and identify me as and form kind of a sense of my own sense of self-identity. 
Now, I want to lead you through an exercise with me. Uh, that's why I wanted you to have pens. So there should be pens on the chairs, on the sides of the chairs, on Velcro, scattered throughout. Maybe your neighbor has one. I want to invite everyone to have a pen in your hand, if possible. If you don't have one, that, that's okay too. You could, I know you all have cell phones. You could take notes in those or whatever. Uh, somewhere where you can write it down. And I want to invite you to do something. Like My vision for this is actually uh, you writing on your left hand for whatever reason. This is the thing in my head. But you could use paper uh, as well or whatever you want to do. But, but, but maybe perhaps go with me and perhaps write, write these things on yourself. I'd like you to think with me of some identity markers. And we have some uh, Tom with the pens. Thank you, Tom. You can raise your hand and he'll, he'll get you a pen. Uh, write, write down... Uh, one demographic identity marker. Now this might be your age, maybe your race or ethnicity, your gender, something that you think people might associate with you when they think of you. Okay, this is obviously one thing that they might form part of your identity or your self-identity. Write down one professional marker, maybe on your hand or paper. One, one, one thing that just marks you as, it could be the profession you're in, profession you used to do, the thing you want to become, the, maybe you're retired, whatever it is, one, one word in which you would be associated with regarding profession. Uh, write down one passion or personality trait that you're known for, something that, you, that other people would associate with you, uh, that you're really passionate about or, or known for, one passion or personality trait. And then finally, write down one relationship that you're known for. Now, maybe for you, that's that's uh, father or mother or daughter or sister or friend or cousin or you know, something like that, something kind of relational marker that, you're, that you would be known for. Oh, you're that person's blank. These are things that define us, things that define ourselves, things that other people define us as, these identity markers. Now, there are also identity markers that you might carry with you that you feel less comfortable with. Some ways in which maybe you've been misunderstood or mislabeled or something that you've, you know, you've really strived for and it's fallen apart. You know, all kinds of things like that that form sometimes negative identity markers. I want to share with you just a few stories from my life to prompt your thinking. But, but what I'm hoping to do is, is prompt in your mind some other labels which you have been attached to that you might be less comfortable with. And you can also add those to the list that I've given you. Long ago, I was a waiter in a fancy Afghan restaurant in Old Town, Pasadena. And uh, to the chagrin of Abdul, the owner, when the LA Times reviewed us, I was the waiter pouring the water in the picture. It says authentic Afghan cuisine with a white guy pouring the, pouring the water. It's still up on their, on their wall. And... One day, a group of ladies came into the restaurant who had obviously been drinking a lot uh, at the bars before they came in, and uh, they were celebrating one of their birthdays, and one of them said to me, hey, what do you guys do back in your country? Uh, I should do a higher voice, but I can't. <laughs> what do you guys do back in your country uh, for, for birthdays? And I'm like, what, Mike? I'm from a, what? You know? And uh, as I'm just stuttering, they, sa they said, oh, I know belly dancing. And this whole group of drunk ladies was begging me, telling me, oh, you got a belly dance for us. It's a birthday, you know. And I'm like just stunned. I'm not often speechless, but I was completely speechless. Like, what about me makes you think I'm an Afghan belly dancer? What? You know. <laughs> Have you ever been misunderstood or mis mislabeled in some way? My first day of high school, one of my classes was a typing class. And in that typing class, I must have asked a couple of dumb questions because there was a moment in which the teacher uh, looked at me, looked down at the roll sheet, looked back at me, looked at the roll sheet and said, I see your last name is Robbins. You're not by any chance the brother of Tim Robbins, are you? And I said, yeah, that's my older brother. And he said, could you come see me in my office? And on my first day of high school, I got called into the office uh, of this teacher, and he said, you know, I'm going to transfer you to another class. He said, I just could not get along. I could not stand your brother, and I can tell we're not going to get along either, so I'm just going to transfer you right now and save us both a world of hurt. And I just, like, melted down crying. <laughs> like, Whoa, Tim, what have you done to me, man? And I, is this going to be my whole experience in high school? Because my last name associated me with apparently someone who uh, was a handful Thank you, Tim. Have you ever been associated with something or labeled with something where someone just, you were judged or you were, you were in a hole 
from the very beginning because of something. You might, you might write that down. When I was a child, I, my dad took me to high school football games. In Merced, like that was just a thing to do on Friday nights. Thousands of people would come out into this college stadium that we had where the high school would play its, its football games. And I, I would just see everyone cheering. And the center of attention was the, was the quarterback for the Merced High team. I said, someday when I grow up, I'm going to be a high school quarterback. <laughs> and I had that dream for my whole childhood. And when I got into high school, I tried out for the team with this, this dream in mind. Someday I'm going to be the varsity uh, quarterback for the Merced High School Bears. And I, I started on the first day of practice. I, I was out there. There was 120 guys trying out for this team. Okay? And I'm out there, and, and, and uh, at some point, I got the nickname. There's, there's very few uh, white people on this, on this team, like just, just, a, just a few of us. And, and so I got the name Weto, <laughs> which is, you know, uh, for, just for being, uh, for being white. And that, that was my label. I was like, oh, the Weto, you know? And, and, and that's how I was referred to. I was like, wait, my dream was I was going to be like, you know, the center of attention here, and you're all cheering for me, and now I'm just weto, you know? Uh, and I've just always working, trying to gain some respect of my teammates and my coaches, and made a little bit of progress, but then the movie Forrest Gump came out, and everyone on my team thought I looked exactly like Forrest Gump, <laughs> which is not what you want when you're like 15 years old, right? And they all made me do impressions, like, me and Jenny was like peas and carrots all the time. And I just seethed inside because I didn't want my identity to be Weto and Gump. I wanted my identity to be this, you know, superstar. But here's how I found myself. And so I just worked hard, so hard. I never missed a practice. I came early. I lifted weights. I just, I just everything I could to strive to be. Just like, just like Frank, I had my identity wrapped up in this. I wanted to be that starting quarterback. And I just worked. And, you know, fortunately, you know, for me, a bunch of people got, became ineligible, uh, so I moved up <laughs> of the charts. I, I got my chance, actually. I actually became the starting varsity quarterback for the Mercer High School Bears. Wow, right? And, uh, and we started winning some games my senior year, and, and I actually got appointed to be the captain of the team. And, I, and, I, and actually, one time, the fourth game, I led a, a, a comeback victory a drive in the final few minutes, and I became a hero quote of the newspaper and everyone wanted to be seen with me and take pictures with me after the game and all the cute girls would hug me and I for about a couple of weeks <laughs> was a hero in my community and I had achieved the identity that I had striven for for all of those years wow then we started losing uh, and we lost every game for the rest of the season and it all started on the homecoming game in which we lost 42 to nothing and I threw four interceptions and was sacked ten times. And I know that statistic because there was an article in the newspaper written about me and my performance the next day that everyone in the town uh, read and discussed in barbershops. And halfway through that game, all the fans that had been cheering for me and, and praising me and, you know, calling out to get my attention just started leaving. They, they literally walked away from the game. They didn't want to be associated with this losing team. And I just, I looked up and just person after person was like, ah, fuck. and they'd, they'd walk away to go do something they had something better to do than be associated with us. And I, and I just watched their sack after sack after sack, getting up and looking at the crowd, just, just leaving and abandoning us. And just, and I had less friends that night. This identity, which I had just striven for that I thought was going to be who I was just, just fell apart, just like what Frank shared in his story. I wonder if you have an identity that you're just striving for, that you're resting in, that maybe you have some fear that's going to fall apart and it's stressing you out. Well, I want to invite you to another reflection moment. You can pull out your pen and write down answer to these questions. Other identity markers that you might carry. Is there an unfair label that someone in your past has given you and it's seeped into your identity? You know, nobody forgets a nickname they have. Was there some nickname called or just some label that, that people understood you as, you got boxed into? Would you write that down? Maybe some mistake that you've made in your past. Maybe some, some moral failure or some, some error, something that you've made that, that has come to define you. Well, you could write that down. Something that you have failed at. And maybe you think of that and you could write that down. Something that you just don't like about yourself, some trait about yourself which you think defines you, 
and you're uncomfortable with that, write it down. Admit it. That, that that has seeped into your identity. Or maybe even something that you think is a positive thing that you've, you've worked so hard for, but you know it's so fragile. Write that down. These are things that also comprise our identity. How people think of us, how we think of ourselves. Now, how we see ourselves, how we understand our identities is of very much supreme importance for us because what we do in our behavior, it just it flows out of our sense of who we are. Right? Our answer to the question, who are you? Who are you really? How do we understand ourselves? That will, that will define how we react to circumstances. That will define how we, how we behave. Just Our lives are so conditioned based on our sense of who am I? If you look at these labels and if you understand yourself based on these labels, you're likely to behave in a certain way. But I'm here to tell you today that whatever you've written down in your hand, whether you think it's good or positive or, or negative, whatever is down there, that is not the truest picture of who you are. That is not the sum total of who you are. That is sort of what society has assigned to you but we have not yet opened the Bible, have we? We have not yet asked God for our definition. We've not yet said to God, who am I? And it's at this point that I'd like you to introduce you to a God who has a curious habit of giving people new names and by doing so, reshaping their whole identity. You can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 62. Beginning in verse 2, God is speaking to his people and he says, The nations are going to see your vindication and all kings your glory, and you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or your land desolate. But you will be called Hephzibah, which means great delight, and your land Beulah, which means married. For the Lord will take delight in you. Throughout the pages of Scripture, God gives people a new name. We've discussed before how Abram and Sarai were renamed Abraham and Sarah, the father of great multitudes and the great mother. And they took on that identity long before that promise was fulfilled. Jacob, which means he grasped the heel, was defined by this, this struggle with his brother for supremacy. He was grasping his heel as the twins were born. Is renamed Israel, which means he struggles or he wrestles with God. And he's now defined by this, this relationship, this interaction, this wrestling with God, which then becomes the identity for the nation which flows from his descendants. Simon is renamed Peter, which means rock. When he confesses faith in Jesus, and Jesus says, you will now be called the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. And he waffles at times, and he, and he, he cringes from that, but, but he lives more and more over the course of his life in this identity of being the rock. And we see this promise given to all believers in Revelation 2. It says, to the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. God is in the business of giving new names, and when he gives you a new name, it reshapes your identity to yourself and to the world around you. And you need to know that everything that you've written down or whatever words come to your mind or whatever nicknames or labels people have given you, that is not the sum total of your identity. And some of those pieces may be some important part of your identity, but it's not the truest thing. The truest thing are these names that God gives you, and, I, and there's many in Scripture. I'm going to walk you through seven of them. I'm going to just take you on a tour of names that you are given by God which define you more than everything else that you've thought of or written down to this point. And God wants these names to come to you as a gift of grace and reshape your understanding so you can live out of the joy of them. The first one that you got to know is that you are called in Scripture, you are a child of God. 
Write that down on your hand or your paper. 1 John 3, 1, see what love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. In Romans 8, 14, for those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God and the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, but rather the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship or daughtership. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. We sung that song, Abba, I belong to you. Did you know that Abba means daddy? And you are singing to your daddy in heaven. You're a child of God. Now I know that there are some of you, there are many of you that carry wounds from your childhood. Maybe you did not receive the love and care that you, that you should have as a child. Maybe you were abandoned or betrayed by by a parent or caretaker in, in some way, or maybe you're just devoid of that. Now, in some way, you, you bear that and it's seeped into your identity. Well, you gotta know, you gotta understand that you are called by Almighty God, beloved son or beloved daughter. You are a beloved child of the Most High God. And that is a truer identity than anything else that you've written down to this point. Through Jesus Christ, we are brought into and adopted as children of God. Wow. Let that shape your life. This next uh, name that we're given, I want to I give to you, especially if you struggle with sort of your self-esteem and your sense of self-worth, particularly if you don't like the way that you look. This is such a plague on our particular society that we don't like the way that we look. Well, you have to hear this. You are an image bearer of God. We see this all the way back in Genesis 1, 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. You were made in the likeness of God. Now, you do not look like an airbrushed, photoshopped picture of an anorexic 19-year-old model. Nobody does. You look like God. The God who made the oceans and the waterfalls and the redwoods in Yosemite, at some point in time, he said, I don't have one of you and I want one. And he crafted you and he said, this is very good. And it said that you bear the fingerprints of your maker. You're an image bearer of God. Believe that at some deeper level than whatever physical labels you've been given at some point in the past. Related to that one, you are God's masterpiece. We see this in the New Living Translations, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So yes, there was a fall of sin which kind of brings some marring to the image of God within us, but God has reshaped us and remade us in Christ and he says to you, you are a masterpiece. Now whatever failures or dark labels from the past, you're a masterpiece to God and you're able to live out this great calling that he has for your life. You're a masterpiece. In John 15, 15, we hear that we are called friends of Jesus. I no longer call you servants, Jesus says, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. What a wonder that is that we would be called friends of Jesus. I mean, I would just settle to be called a servant of Jesus. That is is a badge of honor. Many apostles throughout the New Testament, they wear that, that as a badge of honor. I'm a servant of God. But Jesus goes even beyond that and calls you a friend. I think many of us have misunderstood grace, and it goes something like this. We think we were in a dark pit, you know, bound for hell, and then God, by his grace, has now brought us to a place of barely tolerating us. Like, okay, I get 
fine. You're, I still view you lowly, but I guess you can, I guess you're in. But that's never the picture of grace that we get in the Bible. Jesus, his great love for us, receives us as friends. You know, everyone who I've ever known who has a famous friend always finds a way to work that into a conversation. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you know, but my cousin is a, uh, you know, a coach in Idaho or whatever. You know, you just, you just find ways. You're just proud of that identity marker of being associated with someone important. You are a friend of Jesus. Wow. Write that one down. Okay, this next one is mind-blowing, and I still can't wrap my head around it, but we are called temples of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have received from God? The same Spirit of God which created the world, the same Spirit of God which raised Jesus from the dead, is living in these vessels. That somehow these, these bodies which we so denigrate are called temples of the Holy Spirit. Write that down the next time you, you feel otherwise. You are a temple of the Spirit. This next one I think that we hold too lightly. We throw it around. We, we use this language so lightly, but it's equally profound. You are an important member of the body of Christ. We see in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. You know, something interesting, it says part here, usually the word is, is, is member there, and the most important thing you have to know about that word is that it's not referring to any sort of extraneous body part. There are no fat cells in the body of Christ. No one has to be the appendix. Everyone is a, an eye or an ear or a hand or a foot in this metaphor. You by being a disciple of Christ are an important part of this gathering here of the body of Christ. And we together form, it says, like, a, like an organism. We, we form the actual body of Christ, which is, which is making Christ present in our world. And you have an important, important role in this body that represents Jesus to the world. Hands and feet of Jesus. That's you. That's who you are. There's many more, but I'll just offer you one more. You are an ambassador of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20 We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Think about the way the United States designates one diplomat to go to a foreign land and be the ambassador to that country. And that person is charged with the all-important role of being a representative of their entire nation. And that person goes there to broker peace, to build relationships, to make treaties, to make stands on issues on behalf of their people, on behalf of their government. And we are given that amazing title that we as citizens of God's kingdom are living here in a foreign land as ambassadors. And as we live out our calling in whatever realm that we are in, we are brokers of peace between God and the world. We are, we are offers of that. We, as we make our stands, as we build relationships, we are ambassadors of Christ, making Christ's appeal to reconciliation through us. You are an ambassador of Christ. Now you are faced with a choice. How are you primarily going to understand yourself? Are you going to primarily understand yourself based on just whatever labels your world gives you, whatever labels you've kind of given yourself, or are you also going to hold up that label that God has given you? Can you believe those just as much? Your truest identity is who you are in Christ. Beloved child, ambassador, temple of the Spirit, member of the body of Christ, masterpiece, image bearer. Return with me back to that story. Remember the story I told you about when I was playing football and the crowd abandoned me, right? 
in the middle of all the interceptions and the sacks, I was looking up and the crowd was departing. Well, all those, th those, those weeks in which there was a huge crowd that was cheering and trying to get my attention, I was never able to see my father up in the stands. He was always sitting in the same seat where I sat with him as a kid. He was always up there, but I could never find him because there was such a crowd of people cheering and waving at me. I could never find him when I looked up. But when the people started booing and hissing and doing this and walking away, as the crowds parted and left, I looked up and I could see my dad again. And he was sitting in that same seat where I always was, giving me a thumbs up. You know, every time I get, I get up, look at him. Every game, the rest of the season, I look up to empty stands except for my dad. And that's when I decided, <clears throat> deep in my heart, that I was no longer going to rest my identity in my performance or the cheers of the crowd or this label I constructed for myself. I was just going to say, <clears throat> I'm his son. I'm, I'm that man's son. That's who I am. And this is what God offers to us. We do not have to be defined by the crowd or these labels or these constructs. We can just look up to our Heavenly Father and know that we're His children. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gifts in it. Amen.